Welcome to Eagle Brook Church. We are so glad that you decided to join us this weekend. We are continuing a series called Ghost Stories, where we are looking at a few stories in scriptures that are a little bit uh, spooky, if I might be able to say that. These are the stories you wouldn't read to your children right before they go to bed, okay? These are the stories that sometimes if you are an avid Bible reader, you would rather skim or skip. These are the stories that involve angels, demons, and the supernatural, the world that we can see and the world that we cannot see. But while we would rather skim or skip these stories, they actually tell us a lot about our God. They tell us a lot about his character, and they are in the scriptures for a reason. And so this weekend, I want to look um, at a text in the New Testament of Jesus, demons, and pigs. Now, right away, you're going, okay, we got that week. Okay, we're at demons and pigs week. Yes, okay, this is, it's, there, there's so much in this text that I think can truly help us because whenever we start talking about God and his angels or the devil and his demons, it just gets a little weird. It gets a little spooky and we're kind of going, is this real? Like, what what are we really talking about? I was riding in the car with my son this week and uh, he's talking to Siri in the back on his iPad. He says, Siri, show me a picture of God. I said, what are you doing back there? He's like, you talk about God all the time. I want to know what he looks like, okay? And then this is the picture that popped up. He's like, oh, so this is who sent his one and only son to die for us? I'm like, kind of, but that's not, no. But, but think about it. When you pray, isn't this who you kind of think of a little bit, like in the clouds and kind of floating around? And then when you think of the devil, you think of this guy in a red costume with horns and demons ready to do his handiwork. And it could just get weird about how we kind of put the devil and God in sort of these categories, you know what I'm talking about? Like when things are going really well, we're like, God is good. When the Vikings win, we're like, God is good. (laughs) But one kicker misses a field goal and we're like, the devil is a liar. Something's wrong. He's got sin in his life. I don't know what's going on, but he needs to get it together. And you can just kind of go back and forth. I know people that are just like, I'm broke because of the, dev- of the devil. I'm like, no, you're broke because of Target and Amazon. That's why you're broke. The devil ain't got nothing to do with that. I mean, sometimes some of the trouble we find ourselves in are a result of the decisions that we made. And then there are some troubles that we find ourselves in that are indeed a direct result of spiritual warfare. I love how the apostle Paul wrote it to the church in Corinth. He said, for though we walk in the flesh, we're not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. To destroy strongholds. I think when it comes to understanding spiritual warfare or evil influence or demonic influence or a spiritual stronghold, I think it's vitally important that we don't overestimate every bad thing as demonic influence. I don't think we can just demonize everything. And then I don't think we can swing to the other side and completely underestimate the fact that there, is, there can be the possibility of demonic influence in our lives. A demonic attack, a spiritual warfare that is happening between light and darkness for our souls. I think there are some strongholds that can be very natural. I think there are some strongholds that can be supernatural. Some people can be tempted to lie. I'd say that it's a natural temptation to lie whenever you're afraid of something making you look bad. But then there are those people who it's like they couldn't tell the truth if they tried. It's like they don't even have control. I'd say some people can struggle with lust. I'd say that that's a natural temptation that a lot of people struggle with. But then there's those people who have a sexual addiction, a sexual stronghold in their life where they they don't have control. I know some people who can struggle with anger. There's many natural things in the world that can just make someone angry. But then there's those people who get angry at a level I think we'd all look at and say, 
There's something going on here that is deeper than what we can see in the natural. When I think of my definition of a stronghold that is beyond natural influence, it would be when you no longer have the thing, but the thing has you. When you no longer have the thing, but the thing has you. When you don't have an addiction, the addiction has you. When you don't have an alcohol addiction, the alcohol has you. When you're not just looking at pornography, it has you wrapped around its finger. When the thing you want to stop can't be, can't be stopped because it's actually calling all of the shots in your life. It can be difficult. For you and me to identify what is a supernatural challenge versus a natural one, when do we see a therapist? When do we just see a pastor? It can be difficult to know what to do in the natural about a supernatural challenge, especially if it involves someone you love, especially if you've got a front row seat watching somebody else struggle and you're just going, I wish I could help them and I'm just not really sure what to do when you think a child or a spouse is fighting something supernatural, it could leave each and every one of us very, very stuck. And there's a story in the New Testament about a guy who has had his life ruined by demonic influence. And I believe this story is going to help us wrap our minds around what we can do in the natural about supernatural challenges. And I believe that if we're going to engage in spiritual warfare against an enemy we can't see, we have to recognize how that enemy works so we can combat it. And I think we're going to get some clues from that in this passage found in Luke chapter 8. It says this, they sail to the region of the Gerasenes. They is Jesus and the disciples. Uh, this region is a, a very toxic region. This is not a Christian or a Jewish region. This is very new for Jesus, he says, which is across the lake from Galilee. When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had commanded the impure spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him, and though he was chained hand and foot, and kept under guard, he had broken his chains and had been driven by the demons into solitary places. He is on the outskirts of the city. He has been driven out, and he is all alone. Jesus asked him, what is your name? Legion, he replied, because many demons had gone into him. And they begged Jesus repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. A large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. The demons begged Jesus to let them go into the pigs, and he gave them permission. They said, hey, can we get a transfer? And Jesus said, okay, that's cool. And then, when the demons came out of the man, they went into the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. What a rather peculiar ghost story we have here today. Now, if we're going to defeat an enemy, we have to know how that enemy works. If there are evil and demonic forces that are against us, we have to know how those forces operate. I have very dear friends who have invited me to go hunting and camping. Um, I can't tell if they want me to go for community purposes because they want to spend time with me and grow spiritually in the woods together, um, or if their invitation is merely for their entertainment purposes because they want to see me scared out of my mind running through the woods in the middle of the night. I can't tell which one it is. However, while I pray and consider their request for me to enter into the wilderness, I have questions, lots of questions about hunting and camping, mainly about wild animals. Because while hunting, I've heard you can become the hunted. And so what this has led to in many conversations is me getting a keen understanding of bears and how they, in particular, operate. So one friend says to me, Ryan, you ain't got to worry about bears. If you see a bear, what you need to do, you need to identify yourself and talk calmly to the bear so, so the bear knows that you're a human 
and not an animal. That's what somebody tried to tell me with a straight face. Remain still. Stand on the ground. Slowly wave your arms. Help the bear recognize you as a human. You want me to walk up to a bear and pull out my identification and say, hi, my name is Ryan Link. Hey, Mr. Bear, it's nice to meet you. What are they, the FBI? No, it's a bear. This is not a negotiation, okay? Then another friend says, hey, man, you ain't got to worry about a bear. All right, you just have to understand what kind of bear you're dealing with, okay? He said, hey, um, if, you know, because sometimes you hear this rumor about the play dead thing, you know what I mean? They're like, hey, if it's a brown bear, you know, then... You know, then you should leave your pack on and play dead. So if I see a brown bear, I'm supposed to just fall to the ground and play dead. However, if you roll up on a black bear, do not play dead. They will eat you, okay? So I'm like, so at 10 o'clock at night, I'm supposed to decide which one is a brown bear and which one is a black bear, and what if I get it wrong? I'm not going with you, bro. I mean, it's like, I, I, and as you can tell, I am emotionally, spiritually, and physically prepared for an encounter with the bear should the Lord ordain our paths to cross. <laughs> and, and here's what I believe could happen today. I believe that it's possible that somebody in this room could learn the strategy of the enemy in their life, and you could be set free. I believe that something could happen this weekend where you find yourself going, I didn't know that the enemy was trying to get me in that position, and that's why he has been able to wreak havoc in my life. And so when we look at this story, I want us to understand the strategies that the enemy uses to ruin this man's life, because I want you to know how he operates. And here, here's what you have to know. The first thing that is a part of the enemy's strategy for our life is, number one, isolation. Isolation. He, you, you notice he, he got him. He got him out in the city. This is a man whose life has been ruined by an invisible enemy with visible consequences. We, we know the man uh, wore no clothes, lived like a subhuman, like a wild animal. He's a caveman in the worst way. And the text tells us that he's been this way for a long time. And in the process of all that he's been dealing with, he's not dealing with just demonic forces, but he's also dealing with a village that is working against him. They've come to the conclusion that he is a danger to society, and therefore their plan was to chain him up, to keep him from hurting other people, which perhaps is the wise thing to do. But it doesn't necessarily make it the God thing to do. Because what I know about you and what I know about me is what we love to do with messy people is to put them in categories as far away from us as possible. The messier they are, the further we want to be. When it comes to people with messy situations, we want their problems to be on somebody else's desk. We would rather pay somebody else to deal with them than for us to deal with them ourselves. What's interesting about Jesus is he got into a boat from his hometown to go to an away game. And as soon as he gets off the boat, the first person he sees is this guy. You think Jesus was surprised? No, he's Jesus. He knew what this man was going through. He knew his issues, and he was not intimidated by his issues. He was not surprised. He knew what he was getting into when he got into the boat. And I have to wonder for us, if in our natural instinct to retreat, from people with issues, if we this weekend should pause and pray about moving towards someone everyone else has been moving away from, imagine if there was something in us that just said, you know what, what if it is the God thing to get a little closer? It should be noted that God knows our issues that others are unaware of and still loves us just the same. So who are we to just go to pick and choose who to help and who not to help. The village's plan was to chain this man far away from them, and that plan didn't work. He had supernatural strength and would actually break the chains. If only he had enough strength to break the demonic force that was on his life. And what breaks my heart about this man's story is the line where it says, 
driven by the demon into solitary places. This is where the enemy does its greatest damage. When we find ourselves ostracized or disconnected from community, whenever I'm talking to someone who's really going through a tough time, what often makes me sad isn't the thing that they're battling. It's the fact that they're battling it alone. That's why I think of his strategy as isolation. I think that our strategy should be community. I want to encourage every single person under the sound of my voice to be in a small group, whether it's formal or informal, whether it's Zoom, whether it's in person, whether it's for that, that there is a group of people that know who you really are. You want to know a great way of actually finding community? Serving. You start serving. You start volunteering. Because here's the deal. Let's say you don't like those people. It's only an hour. <laughs> and then you get to go home. So you really get to test some things out and serve the kingdom of God. It's an awesome, it's an awesome deal. But I've got to encourage us not to fall for the trap of the enemy. And I think that the enemy has strategized in so many people's lives. It's like, if I can just get them alone, we're good. And for you, maybe the thing that would break a chain in your life is simply inviting some strangers into it to go, I, I, I don't know, but man, you're a believer. I'm a believer. Maybe, maybe we could help each other out. You might not even be a believer here today, and you might actually go to a small group of believers that could actually set you free. Who knows what could happen? But this weekend, what I have to urge you to do is you've got to do your part to make sure that you don't remain vulnerable to the enemy's tactics, whether you've been ostracized by somebody else or you've made the decision to retreat. I encourage you for our strategy to be We've got to be in community. The second strategy that we see in this text is that the enemy likes to use mind games. This demon says to Jesus, Jesus, son of the most high God. This is what these demons say in response to Jesus's command to come out of the man. In the background of this text is this ancient superstition that you had spiritual power over another person if you knew and could say their exact name. This is why the unclean spirits address Jesus with his full title, Jesus, son of the most high God. According to these superstitions of the day, it was like a round of artillery fired at Jesus. The enemy is playing a mind game with Jesus. One scholar writes it this way. He says that the full address of Jesus's name is not a confession of Jesus's dignity, but a desperate attempt to gain control over him or to render him harmless. He's trying to get Jesus to not know who he is. He's trying to get Jesus to, to go, I, actually, I, I not only have this guy, this unnamed demon-possessed man, but I actually could take you too, Jesus. But for Jesus, he's going, uh, I'm, I'm not going to let you have mastery over me, and guess what? I actually know who I am. And so I, I've just watched the enemy work in people's lives up here. I've watched the enemy destroy and wreak havoc in people's marriages, in people's careers, in people's relationships with the war in their mind. Playing these mind games, I just can't change. Even if I try, I'll always be stuck. I can never get out of debt no matter what I do. I'll always struggle financially. No one really loves me. If they really knew me, they wouldn't want anything to do with me. I'm not a good parent. I'll always struggle with my physical appearance. I'll never like my body. I can't get close to God. I can't hear God. I'm sure it has to be me. It has to be my fault. There must be something wrong with me because everybody else is experiencing God in these powerful ways, but not, not me. From what I can tell online, it seems like everybody else is having a pretty good life. But me over here, I'm just, I'm just struggling. And what we see Jesus do in this passage is the same thing that I think we should do in our lives. He didn't play mind games. He just used his authority. He walked in his identity, in his father, and you and I have been given the exact 
same authority. You and I have been given the exact same identity. And so the thing that I want you to see is, is this in Romans 5.8. It says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. If we were to zoom into the text a little bit more and break down every little Greek word, here's what we would gather. Not just while we were still sinners, while we were still sinners and enjoying it, Christ died for us. You know what that means? It means on our worst day, somebody thought we were valuable. You want to know the value of something, what someone is willing to pay for it. So the next time you find yourself going, no one's ever going to love me. Somebody already did. And they gave their life for you. So the next time the enemy tries to play that mind game with them, you show them the verse. Well, actually, somebody already paid for me. So somebody loves me. I am lovable. And Jesus thought I was worth dying for on my worst day. In my worst day when I was having a good time and I shouldn't have been. Jesus, he died for me. I am loved. I am lovable. I am somebody. I have a bright future. I can overcome. So when you find yourself discouraged in dealing with mind games, I have to tell you, you've got to spend time in Scripture. You've got to spend time with Jesus because the more that time that I spend with Jesus, the more at peace my mind is. I talked about this verse last week, and I want us to look at it again. It says, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts you. Because he trusts you. I think if... The enemy's strategy is, is mind games. I think our strategy has to be to guard our minds. And I think we guard it with, with Scripture. Anytime you're not feeling like you're a good enough parent or a good enough leader or a good enough teacher or a good enough spouse, or, and you've got all of these mind games and you're thinking about how, what your appearance is and what people think about you, you open the word of God because it's easy to be inspired on a weekend service. But then you don't want to know what happens Monday. And then Tuesday and then Wednesday and by Thursday, you could forget who you really are. The man in this story had been struggling for a long time, but he had one experience with Jesus and everything changed. I believe the same thing can happen for you and for me. Jesus commanded the legion of demons to leave the man. They got transferred to the pigs. The demons go off, off a cliff, which is just crazy. Uh, then, uh, this upsets everyone. Uh, just so you know, uh, the estimated value of a herd of pigs in today's society is $2 million. A lot of bacon, I know. <laughs> when those tending the pigs saw what had happened, they ran off to the town and said, hey, y'all won't believe what happened. I got to tell you guys a story. So people from the town came and saw Jesus, and the scriptures tell us that they found the man who used to be demon-possessed in his right man, right mind, and wearing clothes, okay? The man has gotten clothes, and he is in his right, man, right mind at the feet of Jesus. And then this is what the scripture tells us. It says, then all the people of the region of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them. Because they were overcome with fear. You're afraid of a free man? I thought you were afraid of the demon-possessed guy. Interesting. So he got into the boat and left. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away saying, return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And he went away, proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. When Jesus set this man free, the man's like, I'm going with Jesus. He got into the boat like, yeah, I'm riding with you, man. You think you're going to leave me here with these people? Th these are the same people who used to chain me. The, the demons were like, please don't make us leave. But the man was like, please don't make me stay. Don't, don't leave me here with these people. And this is where I think we see the third strategy of the enemy. It's intimidation. It's intimidation. Things that we don't want to face. Rugs that we don't want to pull up because we're afraid of what's under them. Sometimes we just want to escape. Sometimes we'd rather just sign up for what's easier. Sometimes we'd just rather have a fresh start. 
And the enemy can use our past like he did with him to intimidate us for moving forward in the future that God wants us to have. <laughs> the man in this story isn't given a name, he's given a pain. He's just known as the man from whom the demons had gone. I mean, of all the reputations one could have, I'm not sure that's the one you would want, okay? Imagine going to work. Oh, yeah, there go Larry. He used to have demons in him. Y'all know Larry? I mean, like, who wants that reputation? Well, you would want to leave with Jesus, too. I think we'd all want a fresh start if we had that reputation. But Jesus saw something different. What he saw, what the man saw as a weakness, Jesus saw as a strength. What the man saw as an insecurity, Jesus saw as a testimony. And so if his strategy is intimidation, I think our strategy has to be we have to trust God's direction. We have to trust God's direction because the way the story is told in the Gospel of Mark is that the man told all the Decapolis about Jesus. The Decapolis was the 10 cities in this region that were Gentile, non-Jews, which means these people had never experienced or heard about Jesus ever. Nobody in that village had heard about Jesus. But Jesus takes away the intimidation and gives him a mission and says, hey, I want you to go home. I want you to tell everybody what I have done for you. I guarantee you, when this man was sitting in a cave by himself, chained, cutting himself, overwhelmed by the enemy, he couldn't see himself doing a 10-city tour date telling people about Jesus, whole, in his right mind, and free from the power of the enemy. This man's the first missionary to the Gentiles. He's the first one to go, hey, guys, I know you've never heard of this Jesus guy, but you remember me? I'm the guy that used to have demons. You know why all your bacon's gone? I'm that guy. <laughs> He's the first. He's the first. What, what, what does that mean for you and for me? It means you can be the first. You can be the first one in your family to break an addiction. You can be the first one in your family tree not to cheat on you cheat on their spouse. You could be the first couple in your family not to get divorced. You could be the first one in your friend group to stand up to a bully. You could be the first person at your job to start a Bible study. You might be the first person in your corner of the world that becomes a Christian at all. And I know the enemy wants to intimidate us to make us believe that we can't be the first to anything. But what this spooky and very odd and weird story has to tell us is that God can use people who have a past and have been overwhelmed by their circumstance. As crazy as this story is, I'm very encouraged by it. And I think you should be too. I think we all should be encouraged to know that if God can turn a demon-possessed man into a 10-city tour evangelist, what can't he do with us? What can't he do with you? So in summary, number one, I want to encourage each and every one of us to get in community, whether it's formal or informal. And perhaps it's going to require us getting outside of our comfort zone, but I have to encourage us to jump into community. Maybe, maybe you start serving. Maybe you, you check out one of our small groups. Maybe you go to the next steps area at your campus or on our website and you just you just click that button you just talk to that person and you just go help me figure out my next step to get into community maybe you'd even consider quest 180 if you don't know what quest 180 is it's, it's a powerful ministry here that is open to anyone in recovery from any type of addiction for themselves and the people who love them and if you're really dealing with a stronghold that you don't have, it has you. Don't let the enemy isolate you by yourself. Number two, we gotta guard our minds. 
We can't keep letting the enemy win these mind games because mind games are going to come for each and every one of us at every season of our life. I think that's a part of life. Thank God for the scripture. Thank God for his encouragement. Thank God for messages online. Thank God for music that can lift our souls, that can remind us of who we are. And when we engage in those things, that's how we guard our minds. It's how we guard our souls. It's how we stay encouraged. And lastly, I want to encourage each and every one of us to trust God's direction. Don't you dare let the enemy intimidate you from being who God has called you to be. I can tell this weekend there is a group of people who never knew that they could be the first. And I hope that whole paradigm was broken this weekend. I hope that you are encouraged. I hope you walk out of church a little bit different with a little bit of a different swag in your step, a little bit just going, you know what? Who says God can't use I mean, Who says God can't use my family to change a community? What can't he do with us? We can be the first. Our enemy is strong, but Jesus is stronger. In case you've never read the end of the book, we win. <laughs> Spoiler alert. So in moments where you find yourself overwhelmed, in moments where you find yourself wondering, going, man, I just don't know if, if I can beat this thing, hear it from me. Yes, you can. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And there's something powerful when you believe that. The isolation, the mind games, and intimidation can feel overwhelming. But I believe our God is in the business of overcoming the most overwhelming of circumstances. And my hope and prayer is that you would put your life into the hands of a loving God who went to great lengths to purchase your sins. He died on a cross for you. And you often need to remind your enemy of just how much somebody paid for you. That's what I want to encourage you with this weekend. That's what I think we gather from this ghost story. God, I thank you so much for Eagle Brook Church. God, I pray that you would help us to have the strength and courage perhaps to get outside of our comfort zone and step into a community of people that can help us fight battles. God, I pray that you would help us to keep our mind focused on you. Help us to win the war in our mind. And God, I pray that, that we would trust your direction. If you're pointing us to the left or to the right, God, I pray that we would obey you, that we would walk in that direction and trust that we can be the first anything that you've called us to be. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Join us next week as we continue our series, Ghost Stories. Have a fantastic weekend.